Good evening, Tiger fans near and far. My name is Ashley Jones. I'm the Assistant Director of Athletics Communications here at DePaul University. I'm so excited that you've taken the time out of your day to join DePaul Athletics and the Putnam County Community Foundation in celebrating the 35th anniversary of National Girls and Women's in Sports Day. National Girls and Women's in Sports Day, also known as NGWSD, began in 1987 as a special day in our nation's capital to recognize women's sports. The day united premier organizations and elite female athletes to bring national attention to the promise of girls and women in sports. In the beginning, NGWSD served as a remembrance of Olympic volleyball player Flo Hyman for her athletic achievements and dedication to promoting equality for women's sports. Hyman died of Marfan syndrome in 1986. It has since evolved into an event to acknowledge the accomplishments of female athletes, the positive influence of sports participation, and the continuing struggle for equality for women in sports. NGWSD is powered by the Women's Sports Foundation, supported by its team of champion athletes and celebrated through the year by schools and community serving organizations across all 50 states and Washington, DC. Last year, I had the pleasure of inviting 60 members of the community, DePaul faculty and staff, as well as current student athletes to an in-person celebration. After seeing the excitement surrounding the day, myself and a team of current and former female student athletes came together to put on an even bigger event, despite a pandemic. This evening, I'll be sharing the screen with three MCs, Abigail Lodge, Christina Barantis, and Grace Truax. These student athletes will help me share stories and memories from some of our trailblazing members of DePaul Athletics, who made an impact both in and out of competition to bolster support and equity for females in athletics here at DePaul. They will also lead us through a Q&A with questions submitted by those who registered for tonight's event. We'll then close with some words of encouragement from females in athletics. And they're gonna share their stories of how they're using their voices and platforms to remind the next generation of female athletes that the future is female. Join us for the next hour as we celebrate, converse, and encourage those young and seasoned that strong is beautiful, inclusivity matters, and that representation is empowering. Before we head into our first part of the National Girls and Women's in Sports Day celebration, I wanna take some time to remind you to follow us on Twitter with the handle DePaul Athletics, on Instagram with DePaul Tigers as our handle. And of course, throughout tonight's uh, premiere, make sure to use the hashtags National Girls and Women's in Sports Day or NGWSD, Strong is Beautiful and Lead Her Forward. We're excited to have you. Feel free to use the YouTube uh, chat section. We want to interact with you throughout this whole event. Have a wonderful evening, and I'll see you at the end. A trailblazer is somebody who is willing to take risks and go in a path that is not already established. They pave the way and leave a path for others. Good evening. My name is Christina Barantis, and I am a junior on the women's field hockey team. I am thrilled to be a part of National Girls and Women's in Sports Day this year and excited to share this next section of the night with you all. Starting in the 1970s, women at DePaul were competing in the Association for Intercollegiate Athletics for Women, or the AIAW. Even though Title IX was passed in 1972, the NCAA started sponsoring women's championships in the early 80s. DePaul competed in both the NCAA and the NAIA in the 1980s and 90s. I was honored to interview two trailblazers of women athletics at DePaul University. Mary Brecher began the women's swim program in 1974 at DePaul. She worked as the women's head swim coach for 38 years and was the assistant and the associate athletic director for 23 years. 
Judy Wilson began rebuilding the men's and women's cross country and track teams in 1992. Even though Judy was only at DePaul for four years, she was instrumental in growing the program. Throughout the following interview, Mary and Judy share their experiences and thoughts on gender equity within athletics. My name is Christina Barantis and I am here with Mary Brecher and Judy Wilson um, on the Trailblazer section of the National Girls and Women's in Sports Day. Uh, I'm very excited to be with them and we are going to start with some introductions. So Mary, could you please just introduce yourself? What did you coach at DePaul when? Did you have other jobs in the athletic department? Just a little background on yourself. Okay, I'm Mary Brecher. Um, I started coaching women's swimming at DePaul in 1974. I actually started the women's swim team and coached, uh, coached that program through 2012. And somewhere in there, well, additionally, at the time I was hired, I was also a uh, taught in the kinesiology department. And in the 90s sometime, I can't really remember, I uh, became involved in athletic administration. So eventually I became associate athletic director. So in 2012, I retired from coaching women's swimming, but then continued on teaching classes as well as working uh, with Stevie Baker Watson with athletic administration. Judy, will you please introduce yourself and explain? Thank you. I uh, actually coached at DePauw from 92 to 96 as the men's and women's track and cross country coach slash director of the program. And prior to that, I was at University of South Florida for one year and at Bloomington South High School. And after DePauw, I left to go to University of Connecticut um, and then back to my alma mater at Indiana and now I'm at Daytona State College in Daytona Beach. And for our first question, Judy, if you want to answer this one first, what was your experience with sports growing up? Well, I was the youngest of six. I'm the youngest of six children. And uh, my sisters, they were always doing um, non-sport activities because they really didn't get the opportunities that I got. I graduated high school in 1984. And so uh, I think I was just at that beginning part of Title IX and and my uh, high school cross country coach was the coach of my brothers. And when I was a freshman in high school, he came to our house, which was a big deal for me because he was recruiting me to be on the first girls cross country team at Batesville High School. And Mary, what was your experience with sports growing up? Well, I'm from a family of uh, the only female with three brothers. So a little bit like Judy in that, uh, I was around my brothers a lot, and so they could do organized sports. Uh, and so I did a lot of stuff with them. But as a nine-year-old, we lived in Texas at the time, and uh, at our little neighborhood country club pool, we had a uh, woman who started wanted to start a local swim team. So as as a nine-year-old, I started swimming, and there you know there was no discrimination in swimming between uh, males and females whatever they offered for the males they offered for the females it wasn't it was just that's just the way it was then uh when i went into high school my family had moved to georgia and who would have ever guessed that in the 60s in georgia that they had girls athletics and so my high school had a really a full slate of athletics for girls we had swimming we had gymnastics we had volleyball basketball tennis uh and so I didn't experience some of the lack of, of uh, opportunities that other females my age did. Judy, how did you confront obstacles as you were developing your coaching programs or have coached many programs now? You, you really take one thing at a time. Uh, when, we, when I started at DePauw, I was men's and women's cross country and women's track. And Mary, you know, could tell you about <laughs> about some of the hurdles or lack of hurdles physically that we had, uh, <laughs> literal hurdles. Um, but, you know, you just, you kind of take one thing at a time and, and, and focus on trying to find solutions. With Daytona State, I've had to build the program. They had no cross country program. And so I've started from scratch and it's just, I mean, the to-do lists were crazy, you know, just going through one thing after another. Um, and the greatest obstacle with this job has been to find 
females to run at the junior college level because of Title IX. You know, Florida State has to have 42 girls on their cross country roster, and that's a lot of that's a lot of people. Great, and Mary, I know you said that you started the swim team at DePaul. So, how did you confront obst obstacles as you were developing a program? Well. Uh... The first couple of years, there were significant obstacles. And the, the big one was having numbers. And uh, because in 74, Lilly Center had not been built. In fact, Lilly Center wasn't built until 1982. So we went eight years with a, uh, we, we had Bowman Gym and Bowman Gym had a, was built in 1920, I believe and had a three lane 20 yard pool. Now for those that might be listening that don't know anything about regulation pools, uh, right now regulation pool is 25 yards. So it was five yards short and three lanes. Well, Lily Center's current pool is 10 lanes, but the big thing was number. So, you know, back then the way I recruited, believe it or not, I would go to this uh, student uh, student affairs office, which had files on all the students. And they let me do this. I'm sure right now they would never let anyone do this, but they let me go through the files of all the female students. And I looked up and got names of anyone who had swum in high school. And so then I contacted, there wasn't email at the time. So I'd have to send them, you know, little messages through campus mail and hope some of them would come out. I also recruited kids from my swim class. If they swam decently. Hey, you want to come out for the swim team? And and what I found was that um, over the course of that first year, I had 12 different girls that swam for me, but only four stuck it out the whole season. They come out for a week or two and go, uh, no, this isn't for me. And then they bail out and then I'd have to go back to my class and recruit a few more. So that was the biggest hurdle. We're just getting numbers so that we could at least have enough to go to meets to be respectful. If, if you build it, they will come, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that's, exactly. That's what happened with the track too at DePaul. You know, we had we had um, kind of a shaky facility there the first year, and then when they put in the new track, I I think our numbers doubled. So it does help for sure to have those facilities. So how can there be an increase in gender equality or just equality in general within sports and within college athletics? Mary, do you want to answer that first? That's a tough question. You know, if there's an easy answer to that, it would have already happened, I think. Um, I think a lot of it has to happen on the national level and kind of filter down. Um, I think we're seeing a greater and greater interest in women's athletics. I think that like the women's final four in basketball, you're seeing great crowds that go to those events. And I hear people talking about, oh yeah, who's playing in that and watching the final games. But I don't think people watch the regular season that much. And that's probably where we need to to work a little harder at that. I know that's one thing, even at DePaul, we have highly su successful women's teams and all our games are free. Um, they're open to the public when um, there's not a pandemic. But like we, we try to increase the number of people that come to the games because they're free and it's good basketball, it's good softball, soccer, field hockey. I mean, even like I know even track and field and cross country is pretty successful and volleyball won the NCAC tournament last year. So we have really successful women's teams. So it's like, how can we get more people to come? And sometimes it just takes one of the guys teams like, oh, they, if they say they're coming, then sometimes more men end up coming to the game too. It takes ingenious ideas, you know, to figure out how to, how do you attract fans to the sports on the women's side? I mean, we're, we're battling society, money, television rights. You know, everyone can't watch everything. What can current female student athletes do to bridge the gap between those who endured Title IX and those shortly after Title IX and just it going throughout the country and then the next generation of female student athletes? Mary, do you want to answer that one first? Sure. Um, I think this event will, will do a lot. I think uh, probably the big thing would be to have events where athletes who had to compete either before Title IX or during Title IX could come back and talk to the female teams about 
what it was like in the old days. Yeah, I think, you know, it takes a concerted effort on the part of each organization to keep their history alive and, you know, and, and out front, I think. But I think for people like Mary and myself, you know, to make sure that, that we are providing some sort of positive message to younger people that, you know, hey, to, to maybe step back and maybe not take everything for granted. Uh, what would you like to see changed in sports on college athletics? Mary, okay, you want well, to go ahead? Yeah, can I go first? <laughs> yes. Um, well, I would definitely like to see more female coaches. When, uh, when I came, actually when I swam in college myself, and then when I came to DePauw, it was really pre-Title IX. And we actually had more females coaching then than we do now. And so it's kind of interesting in that once the NCAA uh, took over women's athletics, well, then what happened was they started paying women, female, they started paying coaches of female teams. Whereas when I was in college, my coach volunteered to do it. She didn't get paid. She was the real, you know, she's one of the real heroes, I think. Um, so when they started paying coaches, well, then they would have applications. And I know being on the administrative side, you get a whole lot more males applying than you do females. And sometimes it's hard to find a female who has as much experience as some of the males that are applying. And, and it's a little bit of a quandary. You want to get females coaching females, but you also want to get the best coach you can. Um, and so it becomes a little bit more difficult to do that. And, you know, it's fortunate that someone like Judy, who had a really strong running background, that that helped her to get into uh, the coaching profession. Uh, but I would, I would love to see more females going into coaching and sticking with it. I think uh, it's, it's a tough profession. The hours are long. You're away from your family on weekends and you get home late and you got to recruit and that type of thing. And it's a tough profession, especially if you have kids, but it can be done. You know, in my sport, usually when schools combine track and cross country for men and women, there's not that many women that are getting those positions. And I don't know if it's because there aren't, you know, available women or, you know, I was asked at one school after I had had 18 years of experience, well, how's it going to be for you to coach men? And I asked, well, have you asked your male candidates how it's going to be for them to coach women? And I asked the question because to me, I've, I've had, I've been pretty successful with coaching the guys and, and when you can get over that, that cultural or societal bias that there is that women just can't coach guys. I mean, if they're relegated to just coaching women, we've got a problem, I think. We know that you guys are two great role models and two great trailblazers for DePaul Athletics <laughs> and then beyond. So I thank you both for uh, coming and being interviewed and for being a part of this National Girls and Women's in Sports Day for DePaul. I know that these young female athletes that are watching and even current college female athletes um, hopefully we'll look up to you all and see how much you have impacted uh, female athletics. So thank you. I don't know about you all listening, but I find learning sports history, specifically women in sports, compelling. Thank you, Christina, Judy, and Mary for sharing your experiences with us this evening. So last year for our National Girls and Women's in Sports Day, we used the hashtag Her Story Matters, a play on history. Trailblazers within DePaul athletics range from coaches and administrators to student athletes and spectators. Sometimes we need to be reminded that our stories and experiences impact those who come after us. The distinction of being a trailblazer requires individuals to step out of their comfort zone to set a course for the next generation. Tonight, we wanna to highlight another trailblazing individual, Jeanette McGowan. Many listeners, however, know her as Jeanette Hill. Jeanette came to DePaul in 1981 and double majored in political science and French, as well as minored in economics to pursue a concentration in international business. Her experience living abroad in countries such as Germany and Italy prepared Jeanette for the excellent international opportunities DePaul would provide. However, going from Germany to California and then landing 
in, a, in small town Indiana to further her education was a bit of a culture shock when she first arrived. For the first time in her life, she needed help coping with being black at a predominantly white institution. Determined to pursue international business, she directed her focus on self-acceptance. She found solace in places such as the Afro-American House, now known as the Association of African-American House, where she shared her anxieties with other Black students. Along with finding community amongst her other Black students at the Afro-American House, Jeanette also divided her time with the women's track team and played basketball for two seasons with the Tigers. Her exposure to track and field in Germany led to her breaking school records in the 100 and 200 meters in 1982. And when she wasn't competing, she was advising her students as a resident assistant. Despite having to socially adjust while at DePaul, her devotion to making her collegiate experience worthwhile was a significant driving factor to her success in and out of competition. Through athletics and taking the time to get to know her fellow Tigers, Jeanette's efforts led her to find community, expose students she advised to some, someone who had different life experiences than themselves, and pushed her teammates to succeed. After graduating from DePaul, Jeanette worked for IBM as a regional manager and earned a doctorate of law from the University of Indiana in 1998. The rigor of being a student athlete at an institution such as DePaul prepared her to learn and continuously pursue excellence. For the last eight years, Jeanette Hill has worked at Citizens Energy Group as the Senior Vice President and General Counsel and continues to be an essential part of the DePaul family. Every trailblazer has his or her own story to share. Their experiences may vary, but the impact one individual can have on the next is essential to highlight. All right, everyone, we have made it to the second segment of tonight's National Girls and Women's in Sports Day virtual event. I want you to stay close to your screen, stand up, stretch real quick, as we head into a HIT workout. Introduced by Grace Truax, a DePaul women's soccer player, as well as a track and field student athlete. Hello, my name is Grace Truax, and I'm a sophomore on both the women's soccer and track team here at DePaul. I hope everyone enjoyed listening and learning from Judy and Mary about their challenges they've had to overcome as FEMA in athletics. I also want to say thank you again to both coaches for spending time with us and help us putting together this event, and for everything they've done and continue to do to help change the culture in athletics and promote female participation in sports. I would now like to introduce my soccer teammate, Allison Harvey. Allison is going to take us through a short high intensity interval training session to help us get our blood pumping and help re-energize for the rest of the event. Let's get it! What's up everybody? I'm Allison Harvey. I am a junior at DePaul University, repping that women's soccer. Woo! Go Tigers! And I'm here today, I'm just going to run us through a little HIT workout. Um, which is, stands for high intensity interval training. Great way to get your heart rate up while also working on strengthening those muscles. This is gonna be body weight only, so you can do it anywhere. I'm outside right now. And we're gonna get after it using an EMOM style workout, which stands for every minute on the minute. So our first exercise is going to be a tarantula. We're gonna be working for 45 seconds, resting for 15 seconds, and then getting back after it. So we have five different exercises. Like I said, first one, tarantula, which is a lunge jump, lunge jump, squat jump. Now modified would just be lunge, lunge, squat. So again, what, would it, what it would look like is right here, lunge jump, lunge jump, squat jump, lunge jump, lunge jump, squat jump. I'm lightly cracking that eggshell on the ground with my back knee, chest is up, I should be able to see writing. Again, modify, just take out the jumps. Next one we've got is four mountain climbers to a push-up. Looks like this, so one, two, three, four, push-up. One, two, three, four, push-up. Modification, I would do those four mountain climbers and then go to my knees for that push-up. All right, nothing's wrong with the knees. Again, we want that full, range of motion to get the most out of that exercise. Exercise number three is bicycles for 45 seconds. So I'm just right here, 
Ripping that core up, modification, rest your heels on the ground, drive up, opposite elbow to the knee. Number four is a triple pulse squat jump. So one, two, three, jump. One, two, three, jump. Modification, give me that triple pulse. Squat it out without the jump. Now remember, heels stay on the ground. I'm driving into that ground. On the, at the top of that squat, make sure we're squeezing the glutes, okay? Fifth exercise, I believe that's five. Yeah, here we go. Fifth exercise is going to be plank up downs. So at about 22 seconds, you are going to switch which arm you're using to get up. So I would switch to my left arm. I'm using that left arm for 22-ish seconds to the right arm. Now modification again, you would just be on those knees, repping it out, working the core in those arms. Again, just to run it back, you've got tarantulas. You've got, I'm spacing out, mountain climbers and push-ups. You've got bicycle abs. You've got triple pull squat. You've got plank up downs. That's five exercises. You're going every minute on the minute. 45 seconds work, 15 second rest, and then you just keep going. Again, we're out here, get after it, go Tigers! <laughs> Before we go to our next MC, I wanna remind everyone that's watching to use hashtag strongisbeautiful, hashtag NGWSD, and hashtag lead her forward. Enjoy the evening. Whew. Thank you, Allison, for that great workout. Who knew five minutes could feel so long? If you guys like that, be sure to check out at DePaul Tigers for more workout videos that have been posted. Now we're gonna hear from a variety of student athletes take part in a Q&A session with questions asked by the members of the Greencastle community. To me, the word strong and beautiful together is a really powerful phrase, but it didn't just come to me like that. While I don't want to speak for everyone, I think a lot of student athletes, specifically female student athletes, can identify with the idea that the words strong and beautiful are often spoke of as inversely correlated, meaning that they don't go together. And I strongly disagree. I think one of the most powerful things ever is the fact that my body can not only actively participate, but succeed in the sport that I love doing. And that action is inherently beautiful in itself. I think a phrase that I really like is that my body is beautiful because it's strong. And I think that's really powerful. If I could give 12 year old seventh, eighth grade Amanda a piece of advice, it would be to not put so much pressure on yourself because looking back at it now, the pressure did the opposite of what I intended it to do. Um, the pressure made me way more anxious, way, way more stressed out. And I think it's really important to remember to be why you're playing this game. Um, you're playing this game because you love it. And it's gonna come down to the fact that you're gonna play your best tennis in college. And that's because at that point, the pressure was off for me. Um, playing division three was probably the best decision for me because it was it's a zero pressure um, scenario. Besides the pressure that your team has, it's good pressure, it's no bad pressure. There's nothing riding on it. Um, so I would tell myself to play loose and have fun, to enjoy the game and just literally play for yourself. Don't play for anybody else because if you're playing for somebody else, it comes from the wrong place and you're not going to be playing your best tennis. And I play my best tennis when I'm playing for myself and I'm playing for my team. And that's something that I would tell 12-year-old um, me. If I could give my 12-year-old self a piece of advice, I think the number one thing I would say is to always have fun, no matter how good you are at something or how bad you are at something. As long as you love what you're doing and you're giving it all you have and you're having fun in the process, that's way better than being miserable and not enjoying what you're doing. The second piece of advice I would give myself is to be patient. You don't have to excel in everything, but as long as you try and you give yourself the space and the opportunity to grow and learn and see what you're good at, see what you're not good at, but allowing yourself to make mistakes and learn from them is extremely important and beneficial. 
And the very last thing I would say is don't be afraid to try new things. You don't know how good you are at something. You don't know how bad you are at something until you give it a real chance to enjoy it or not enjoy it. Love it or hate it, it doesn't matter, but you're allowing yourself to experience so many different things so you can figure out what you really do love. So I was just reading about the NBA a couple of weeks ago, and it talked about something really similar to this question. There was a situation where a head coach got ejected from a game, and his assistant coach, a lady named Becky Hammond, became the first acting female head coach in the history of the league. And the next day after the game, reporters are going through and asking all the players for their thoughts on this historic moment. And one of them responded in a really blunt way and said something along the lines of, I look forward to the day when no one cares. And while it comes off as kind of harsh sounding, I think the sediment there is really important. Um, while it's really important to celebrate these types of groundbreaking moments for women in the field of sports, my sincere hope is that these types of things will become so commonplace in the near future that people stop seeing them as unusual. Women's success in sports should be the norm and not the outlier. In 2021, I am bringing with me the idea that change is going to happen whether you're ready for it or not, and that change can be a positive thing. This is definitely a lesson that I think we've all learned in 2020. Uh, my biggest piece of advice is going to be to lean on your teammates, um, just as how you may lean on your teammates on the field or for me on the golf course. They also are great resources for academics. I know on my team, we have a diverse group of majors, interests and everything. So usually there's someone on your team who can step in and help you out. Uh, maybe in a course that's not necessarily in your major or minor. Um, also just being transparent and planning ahead. Um, coaches are very good if you outline a schedule and professors also are very understanding if you need to miss class for a sporting event. I know for golf, I miss class a decent amount to travel. Um, so just being transparent and honest um, and just talking to them and figuring out a great solution that works both for you to get to compete in your sport and to get the academic work done. I'm saying that my main two pieces of advice are to lean on your teammates and to always uh, be transparent with both your professors and your coach um, in regards to remembering how important academics are in addition to your sport. I'd never say that I struggled to fit on an athletic team. However, in middle school, I made my school's math bowl team. Uh, and that was a team of all girls that year. Um, I guess I was the smartest guy at the time and that's why I was put on the team. Uh, but I was far from the smartest on the team. Uh, and so I was kind of looked at funny and there's a bit of a different power dynamic, I'd say. Um, but I think I overcame that looking back just by making a connection with those girls and uh, putting the friendship before the competition. Uh, it, was, it was a bit weird, I'd say, to have to stay after with a group of six girls who I didn't really know too well um, and try to match up to that because uh, they were very, very smart. Um, but I'd say that putting the friendship before and just really connecting and forming a relationship and kind of a bond with those girls before the competition uh, really helped me to settle in and feel comfortable uh, and overcome that challenge. So my freshman year of high school, I was the only freshman who made the varsity tennis team. And that made it kind of difficult for me to transition and fit into the team right off the bat. So the way that I overcame this challenge was I proved and I showed the team that I was a player that they could count on. Um, teams sometimes aren't typically as welcoming as they should be to newer prospects and newer players. But if you show that you're dedicated and that you're there to play and to, bet, to better the team, eventually they'll see that we all have the same common goal. And that common goal is to play the sport that we love and to get better at it every single day. So I think that that's the best thing you can do. Also try to find if you, if you have any common, common grounds with any of the other players on the team. Maybe you guys like the same TV show or the same type of music 
or you like to hang out at the same places on campus. If you're struggling to fit in, just know that um, it takes time more than anything and they're just as nervous about you. You're gonna be a new player on their new team and they wanna know that you're dedicated um, to the squad. So just prove that you're willing to be there and that you wanna be there for the right reasons. Funny enough, uh, my mom actually secretly signed me up for cross country practice my sophomore year of high school and I didn't know until the first day of practice. Um, I was a little bit reluctant um, and not super excited, uh, but I showed up for the first day and just absolutely loved it. Um, I think there's something to be said about um, you and all of your teammates going out there and just enduring struggle and overcoming all of your obstacles and challenges through the sport together. Um, and that really, really made me passionate about the sport and what made me love it so much. It's so fun to just go out there and you know run a 5K, now a 6K in college um, with a bunch of people and just know like you're all in the same boat, but this is what you've been working for. Um, and despite all that struggle to just cross that finish line, um, it's just so incredible and amazing with your teammates um, and just has made me love the lifelong sport that is running. Initially, I fell in love with basketball from watching my two older brothers play. From middle school to high school, I saw how much fun they had every single time that they stepped on the court. And I also saw how many relationships that they built from dribbling a basketball. And I thought it was amazing and it was something that I always wanted to do and experience. And on top of that, it's something that really bonded all three of us together. We could always do it together. We could always have fun. And it was never a moment where you didn't want to go out there and play and have fun with your siblings. And on top of that, I always loved the idea of being with a group of people, getting to know them, and having them push you not only in basketball, but in your real life to be the best version of yourself. And on top of all of that, you get to go out there and have fun with your teammates, but more importantly, friends. And there's nothing better than having fun with your friends. To me, a great teammate is somebody who is not only a hard worker, but can also be vulnerable, honest, encouraging, and is a great listener. But most importantly, somebody I can consider an awesome friend. Uh, Sydney Cop would have to be uh, the most influential athlete to me right now. Uh, she was a fellow DePaul student. And the reason I picked Sydney Cop is because uh, I think she really uh, embodies what it means to be a student athlete. Um, she's involved in several student organizations. Um, she was the leader of SAC, the president of SAC. Um, she was also on the honor roll, um, made NCAAC Athlete of the Week several times. Um, was all around just a, a great student and a great friend. Um, so I'd have to say that she was the most influential athlete to me. Um, so for me personally on the women's golf team, my coach, Coach Lazar, is the head coach for both the men and women. Um, so I personally have never felt like my sport was underappreciated um, just because we did a lot of practice together, a lot of team bonding. And so I think that um, having that puts me in a unique spot. Um, but I do think that sometimes it is hard to feel that your sport isn't underappreciated. I just personally haven't felt that um, on the golf team at DePauw. I mean, I think that if you are feeling that way, I think talking to your coach is the best thing and figuring out ways to um, engage in some of the same activities that the men's sports are doing. I mean, I think that too, a lot of it comes from um, what your coach is doing and team bonding and ways to kind of foster a positive team environment. So I think that um, I personally have never felt underappreciated as a athlete at DePauw. One way that men's teams can support female athletes is pretty obvious. Uh, it's just to show up to games and events, uh, but even more so to really recognize the hard work that those ladies put, put in each day. Uh, as a football player, I know that we go through a lot of long, intense practices. Um, we still have to come out and compete at a high level um, each weekend and uh, put in a lot of extra effort, whether that's for film study or for extra workouts and things like that. And just recognize that each sport, whether it's men's or women's, uh, is going through the same long process. 
Uh, so just giving credit where credit is due. Um, and then also spreading the word on social media, uh, following those accounts on Twitter and Instagram and putting things out on Snapchat to let people know that there is a game, there is an event going on uh, for the female athletes um, and really just coming out and supporting in large numbers, uh, whether that is after a practice and you have to head over to the basketball court or to the tennis court or the soccer or wherever it is, uh, just getting the word out and attending those games in large numbers and then giving credit where credit is due afterwards is some really big ways that you can support. So the answer to this question is actually really simple because men's teams can support female athletes in exactly the same way that they would want to be supported themselves. Personally, I know that I love it when I see people in the stands cheering us on at our meets or when people wish us good luck before a really big competition. So in my eyes, the best way to show support for female athletes is doing exactly that. It's showing up and cheering at competitions. It's encouraging them after a really good performance and supporting them even after their bad ones. It's volunteering to help out and lend a hand. These are all really easy things that anyone can do, not just male athletes, in order to help support our female athletes. A special thank you to my fellow student athletes for sharing their individual Tiger experiences. And next, Please join me in a guided meditation focused on body positivity. Maddie Barr, a DePaul alumna, class of 2020, and past member of the women's track and field team, works as a yoga instructor. She'll be leading us through a short yoga session. During this time, please use the chat function in YouTube to fill in the blank, my body is. Use any adjectives you would like to describe your body. For example, I would type beautiful so that it reads, my body is beautiful. Please grab your yoga mats and join me in a guided meditation led by Maddie. Hi guys, happy National Women in Sport Day. My name is Maddie Barr, for those who don't know me. I graduated from DePaul in 2020 and I was a member of the women's cross country and track and field teams. Outside of practice, my work study was actually teaching yoga. And so I am here today to walk you guys through a quick five minute yoga flow. And it's really designed for you to A, honor National Women in Sport Day and B, take a little break from your daily routine to focus on yourself and do something that feels good for you. Um, we're gonna mostly focus on some chest and some back work just because a lot of us spend a lot of time staring at our screens, whether it be work or schoolwork. And so really take these next couple of minutes to focus on you and what you need and do what feels good for you and your body. All right guys, so we're gonna start our little mini yoga flow today, working our way into child's pose. So what that looks like is you're going to bring your knees either together on the mat or far apart, whichever one feels better for you. And then you're gonna reach your arms out long in front of you and start to shift your hips back. Your forehead is gonna work its way down towards the mat. If it makes it there, great. If not, don't worry. And then you're just gonna close your eyes in this pose and really start to come to your mat and set your attention for the next few minutes. Focusing on your inhale and your exhale, making sure you're in touch with your body and how it feels through all the poses. So again, breathing in through your nose, out through your mouth. And then on the exhale, you can start to walk your hands over towards the right side of your mouth. So if we're in neutral, our fingers are gonna go over towards the right and we're gonna shift that left hip back. So once you do this, you should really start to feel a nice stretch in your left side body. Again, continuing to breathe, inhale through your nose, exhale through your mouth. On the inhale, coming back through center. And then on the exhale, going over towards the left this time. And we're gonna shift our right hip back, again, feeling that nice opening on the right side body. Trying to relieve some pressure in that low back, hopefully. Again, inhale through your nose. Exhale through your mouth. On the inhale, coming back through center and finding that child's pose once again. And then on the next inhale, we're gonna work our way into our first tabletop. So what that looks like is our hands are right underneath our shoulders, our knees are right underneath our hips, and our gaze is right in front of us on the mat. So you have a nice long spine, including your neck. And we're gonna work through some cat and cows. So on inhale, our belly is gonna drop, our gaze is gonna go towards the ceiling. And then on the exhale, round our spine and gaze goes back between our legs. 
Again, inhale, drop the belly. Exhale, round. And we'll continue to move through this at our own pace, so do what feels good for you here. We'll just hold this for a few more seconds. Again, following your breath. Inhaling, drop the belly, and exhaling, round. And then once you're ready, we'll find another neutral tabletop. And we're gonna shift our weight now back into our heels and finding a seated position. If it feels good, you can curl your toes under to get a nice stretch through our feet, or if you wanna uncurl your toes so they're flat on the ground, that's great too. And then once we're here, we're gonna interlace our hands behind our back. So you have kind of this reversed motion. And then we're going to open our chest and gaze comes up towards the ceiling starting to open that chest like we talked about. Really feeling a nice strong posture here. And then we'll come back through center, relaxing for a breath. And we'll take that same pose one more time, opening the chest. Now on the inhale, we'll come back through center. Our hands come in front of us now and we'll bring them up into cactus pose. So what this looks like is our hands are nice and wide and really strong. We feel a lot of energy through those fingertips. And we're gonna to start to work into a spinal twist in a seated position here. So once we're here, we're gonna turn over towards the right first. So we're gonna twist our spine, our knees and our hips stay facing forward. We feel a nice twist. Our gaze follows towards that right side. And then on the inhale, coming back through center. And then we'll exhale over towards the left. Again, gaze comes with us straight ahead, but our hips stay neutral. Inhaling back through center. And then we'll do that one more time. Over to the right. Inhaling through center. Exhale to the left. Inhaling through center. Great, and then our hands can come in front of us and we'll roll over our knees into a seated position so our legs are going to come right in front of us and they'll be bent to start and then we'll slowly lower ourselves all the way down to the mat for this position we're going to do another spinal twist so our legs are going to start and we'll bring them up just as they are and then drop them over towards the right and our gaze comes over towards the left while we're in this position definitely try and keep your shoulders flat on your mat or your floor wherever you are and don't force your legs to fall all the way to the ground. If it doesn't feel good, then don't do it. And then on your inhale, coming back through center. And then our legs are going to drop over towards the left and our gaze is going to go towards the right, finding that spinal twist on the other side. Again, if we'd like through these poses, just keeping our eyes closed, really focusing inward, continuing to breathe in through our nose and out through our mouth. On our next inhale, coming back through center one more time. And then the final pose that we're gonna find is a waterfall pose. So this is really great to reverse some blood flow and drain our legs. If you're especially a very active person, still playing sports and such, this is a great position. And it's also great for sitting at the desk all day just to get some blood flow and some different change. So our legs are gonna come up and our feet are going to act as if they're flat on the ceiling. And we're gonna flex our feet and then straighten, again, flex, straighten, flex, and straighten. And then we'll just hold it here in a neutral position with our feet, closing our eyes. And you should be able to start to feel that blood flow changing, honestly, and your legs should feel nice and light. And if they need a slight bend in them, if that doesn't feel great to have them fully straightened, not many people can even get them all the way straight, so that's perfect as well. And then our next inhale, we're gonna bring our knees in towards our chest. And maybe even bringing our forehead up towards our knees, finding a tight ball there for a little counter pose. And then on the exhale, we're gonna just drop our feet out long. So we're gonna be laying flat on our mats with our eyes closed, coming back to that breath on the inhale and exhale. And we'll do two rounds of breath here. So if you want to bring one hand to your chest and one hand to your stomach, that's great. And on the inhale, we're going to fill our bellies for a count of one, two, three, four, five. And exhale for five, four, three, two, one. One more time. Inhale for one, two, three, four, five. 
and exhale for five, four, three, two, one. And then our hands can come down by our sides, our eyes are closed, and we're laying flat on our mat, finding our final Shavasana pose. And you can stay here for as long as you like. If you're feeling really comfortable on your mat, stay here and take the time. If not, this is all we have for today, a quick yoga session. Thank you so much for all joining. Again, happy National Women in Sport Day. It was really fun to see all you guys and talk. Hi, everybody. My name is Abigail Lodge, and I'm a senior lacrosse player here at DePaul. First, I want to thank Maddie for leading us through that guided meditation. I hope everybody feels as though they're in a great headspace to start our next segment, The Future is Female. Thank you to the many trailblazers that have started the path and acknowledged and supported the accomplishments of female athletes. While this has led to an increase in sports participation for women and girls, there still remains a continual struggle for equality for women in sports. This next segment highlights different women in athletics who will share encouraging words about the future of female athletics. It is important to listen to their words and think about how we all can help fight for equity. Today, we will be hearing from Dr. Kiki Baker Barnes, the athletic director at Dillard University, a historically black university in New Orleans, Louisiana. Sydney Pirecca, a former lacrosse player at the University of Florida and a current assistant coach at Syracuse University and competes for Pride, a team in the Women's Professional Lacrosse League and others. Please join me in the next segment, The Future is Female. Hey everybody, this is Lauren Cox with the Indiana Fever. I just wanted to say happy National Girls and Women in Sports Day to you all and remind you all to continue working hard, especially on a day like today. Every day we see women breaking down barriers to improve opportunities for the next generation of young girls and women in sports. As part of the Indiana Fever and the WNBA, we know the type of platform we have and the responsibility we have to make sure we are role models for the next generation. Everybody involved with the Indiana Fever is rooting for you all at DePaul during such a tough time for everyone. But remember to work hard and continue to work towards your dreams. Hey guys, what's up? This is Sydney Preka. I played at the University of Florida and I currently coach at Syracuse University. And I also play professional. My piece of advice for being a female athlete is to stay confident and stay positive and work hard. There's a lot of obstacles that you're gonna need to overcome, whether it's on the field being an athlete or just in everyday life. Being able to overcome those obstacles is super important. And the best way to do it is to have confidence and stay positive throughout the whole time. I grew up playing sports, as I'm sure you guys did. Um, I actually grew up being a competitive gymnast, so the sport was pretty individualized. I really didn't have anybody but myself to rely on. So moving forward, um, playing lacrosse and having 30 teammates and great coaches to help me along the way has been a game changer for me. Moving into the WPLL, where they support female athletes and encourage them to not only be a great player, but a great teammate and a great person has completely shaped me into the athlete that I am today. Staying confident and working on myself daily has also been a huge factor, not only on the lacrosse field, putting in the extra work, but off the field, doing things that is gonna help better myself. So try and stay confident as best you can. In order to do that, that's helped me, is doing extra on the field to feel confident. Extra reps, putting in more work, not only to help my teammates, but myself. And I think overall, just trying to enjoy the sport, stay confident, like I've been saying, and feel empowered, whatever you're doing with it. While I was never the most athletically inclined person, it was always my hope and desire to have a career in sports. I played sports as a young girl, but quickly realized that maybe my love for sports could be redirected into another role. I spent time as a student manager in high school and college before moving into roles as a writer and reporter then honing in on public relations and journalism throughout my college career. I love learning, I love meeting new people, and I love communicating. So I feel grateful to have had the opportunity to work hard to be in the position that I am in now as a senior publicist at ESPN. As we look to carve a path for ourselves in our desired field, we often look to those who are already doing the work that we one day aspire to be doing. For a long time, however, I think those roles seemed unreachable but we have a group of ambitious, talented, strong-willed women who shattered glass ceilings, 
so we all could continue to keep climbing. I myself have a number of women who have continuously mentored me and lifted me up and I think have afforded me the chance to be where I am today. As a Puerto Rican, representation also means looking around the room and making sure that it isn't a lot of the same. We must continue to value diversity, strive for equality, and demand equity. So every person not only has a seat at the table, but a microphone to speak on. Sports has great power as we've seen now more than ever over the last year. We all hold our own greatness. So make sure to use that for the good and advancement of what's fair and right. What's up everybody? I am Lori Lindsay, a former US Women's National Team soccer player, and I am also a fellow Hoosier. So hello to everybody in Indiana. Great to be connected with you all, even though it is just virtual. And when I think about how sport or soccer has impacted my life, goodness, we could be here all day. I think that question would be easier answered if I talk about how it hasn't because soccer has been such an integral part to my life and continues to be every day. Um, from learning about teamwork to dedication and determination to perseverance when things get tough to stepping away when that feels right as well. So many life lessons and my career, it expanded 30 years, 14 of those professionally. I played in the World Cup, Olympics. I played with um, some of the most well-known athletes and people um, in the sporting and just world in general, from Mia Hamm to one of my best friends, Megan Rapino, And no doubt were there so many trials and tribulations from, you know, just getting a foot in the door and what it takes to be a professional athlete and the dedication, but also from once you become professional, pay equity, um, the ups and downs of playing in three different pro leagues, what that looked like. Um, so just so, so many ups and downs, so many amazing moments. Um, but I think when I look at my entire career, how it has shaped my life, the biggest thing that sport in these relationships and teammates um, have provided me is a voice, an ability to use my platform for the greater good. There were so many doors opened um, from the players in front of me that said, hey, come on through, use your voice, stand up for what's right, um, and, and, and speak up. And that is the single best piece of advice that I can give anybody, regardless of the sport you're playing, um, us coming together, using our voices, um, and making this world a better place. Open up the door for the person behind you, open up the door for the person next to you, continuing to provide an opportunity for people to speak out to, to make this world a better place. Um, yeah, I hope this, even though it was a short little nugget and we could have been here all day with um, what sport provided, I hope that gives you a little glimpse into what keeps me taking every day, what sport has meant to me, and I hope you can find that in whatever sport you're playing. Thank you, take care. Okay, ladies, now let's get information. Hey you, yeah you. My name is Dr. Kiki Baker Barnes, and I am the athletic director at Dillon University, a small, private, historically black college and university in New Orleans, Louisiana. I am so excited to celebrate one of my favorite days of the year, National Girl and Women in Sport Day. I think it's only right that I, that I share a little bit of my journey with you and what key lessons I have learned from participating in sport. It all started when I was in the seventh grade. I tried out for the basketball team and I made the team. I wasn't very good. However, I had a great coach and awesome parents who believed in me. That belief in me helped me to develop my faith. Faith is a strong belief in your ability to succeed, even when, it's impossible, when it seems impossible and it gets hard. Well, as I said, I wasn't very good, but I began to work really hard and I got better. By my senior year in high school, I had received numerous athletic honors, even being named to the state all-star basketball team. I couldn't have done it without consistent effort. Having faith and not taking action equals no growth. As I began to learn the game, I could see that my efforts was going to pay off 
and I was eventually given the ultimate award, an athletic scholarship to continue my basketball career and education at South Plains College in Leveland, Texas. I finished my final two years of basketball and track at the University of New Orleans in New Orleans, Louisiana. And I received my undergraduate degree in general studies. Being a college student athlete is tough, and I had to learn to focus. Focus is being able to concentrate on what's important and completing the tasks that need to be done. Now that I had received my college degree, it was time for me to begin my professional career. The problem is, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Thankfully, my former coach offered me an opportunity to begin my career in athletics by hiring me as her graduate assistant basketball coach. I eventually became a full-time assistant coach, recruiting coordinator, head coach, athletic director, and now interim commissioner of the Gulf Coast Athletic Conference. As I navigated my career, I always remembered those key lessons from sport, and I am excited to share those keys with you now. Say it with me. Have faith in yourself. Give maximum effort and focus on what's important. As you continue celebrating today, don't forget to slay. Stay learning and yearning. I'm Dr. Kiki Baker Barnes, and now you are ready to get information. Thank you all for joining DePaul Athletics and the Putnam County Community Foundation in celebrating the 35th anniversary of National Girls and Women's in Sports Day. We hope you've enjoyed tonight's premiere and want you to share the moments that might have inspired you. Tweet us, post on Instagram, share a link on Facebook, and show your support for girls and women in sports. I want to say congratulations to those who won something in the raffle. Super uh, happy that you're able to register for tonight's event and hope that you enjoy um, your raffle items. I want to give a shout out and a thank you to the Putnam County Community Foundation um, in supporting us throughout this whole event, as well as giving a, a big thanks to our guest speakers and of course our wonderful DePaul student athletes, both current and former, that helped put this event together and make it possible for you to watch this evening. Have a wonderful evening, everyone, and make sure to be on the lookout for some more National Girls and Women's in Sports Day related posts and activities throughout this year. Have a great night.